With it being the Halloween season, I thought it would be great fun to do a video about sparks and arcs and Jacob's ladders, all those things that are associated with the good old spooky TV shows such as The Addams Family and The Munsters and of course the various Frankenstein movies where somehow the sparks make the monster come alive. Well, we're not going to do that, but we're certainly going to look at sparks and arcs and things of that nature. Before I continue, we should talk a little bit about safety because if there ever was a video where don't try this at home applies, well, this is one of them. We're dealing with some significant voltages. These are two 10 kilovolt transformers producing a 20 kilovolt arc and things like that should not be taken lightly. I have years and years of experience with this sort of thing and I'm using all sorts of safety interlocks such as a dead man switch which you can look at in one of my previous videos but I really want to emphasize this is not something to play around with and the voltages we're dealing with are really quite dangerous. That aside, enjoy the video. So to set up our experiment what I have here is two 10 kilovolt industrial ignition transformers. And what that means is each of the transformers has a terminal that gets energized to 10 kilovolts AC. And what I've done is I've connected the 120 volt inputs to them in such a way that the 10 kilovolt outputs are opposite in phase. So when one of the outputs is plus 10 kilovolts, the other is minus 10 kilovolts, and we have 20 kilovolts between them. And, well, we can attach a couple of wires in the classic form of a Jacob's Ladder and try it. And here it goes. Look at those sparks. And you might be wondering, why do sparks like that move upwards on a Jacob's Ladder? Well, it's because they heat the air and the air becomes a nice hot incandescent material and because of its heat it tends to move upwards and because in a spark the resistance of the air drastically drops well as the air moves up it pulls the spark upwards with it. Now you might say why doesn't the spark just immediately start at the bottom again as soon as it's just inched up just fractionally. Well, what it is is that spark, once it has formed an ionized path between the two electrodes, that path now has a much lower resistance than plain air. So even though as we move up the Jacob's ladder, the spark gets longer and longer, its resistance is still way lower than the voltage needed to start a spark at the bottom of the ladder. Well, if the voltage is 20 kilovolts, that should still happen, right? Well, it's not because these transformers, like pretty much any setup used for this sort of demo, are in one way or another current limited, meaning in the case of these transformers, you're limited to somewhere around 25 milliamps or something like that. So there really is a limited amount of current, which means when the arc is flowing, the voltage drops. So it will typically be below the 20 kilovolts needed to jump across that gap. And yes, I set up that gap in such a way that it just barely allowed a spark to happen at 20 kilovolts. Now I mentioned that the ionization and the heat that the spark causes drastically drops the resistance and it might be nice to demo that and the way we can do that is put a Bunsen burner up on a nice high voltage insulator and then direct it so that it's spewing out its flame right between our two Jacob's Ladder wires and well when I try it up high nothing actually happens. If I move it lower so that it's really producing a flame that almost goes from one conductor to the other, well, you can see that that flame is now keeping the arc right where it is. 
and it will stay there as long as the flame is heating the area. So why is it important to understand that a flame will in fact produce a much easier path for a spark to form than it might otherwise do? Well, a good example might be the case of forest fires. If you have some very high voltage wires and you have a forest fire ripping through, it's not at all inconceivable that that could cause huge arcs to form between the wires and potentially melt and damage the wires. Of course, that might all be irrelevant if the forest fire is so bad that it burns down the power poles and the whole thing falls to the ground. Now, we often use things like glass or ceramics as insulators, and this is probably not a bad opportunity to see how good an insulator glass is. So I'm going to put a sheet of glass between our two Jacob's Ladders wires. And so you can see when the spark gets up to the bottom of the glass, it sort of gets stuck there. The arc suddenly goes a bright yellow to show that the glass is probably off-gassing things like ions. And then, not only does it do that, it actually starts damaging the glass. And, well, you can see how when we turn off the arc, as it cools, there's suddenly a nice long crack forming into the glass. And if we re-energize the arc, it starts going up that crack and really producing severe damage to the glass. So the bottom line is, once you have a break in an insulator like that, it's really no longer going to be very useful. It is quite magical to look at those flames as they dance around the top of the hole in the glass and the colors are really quite amazing. Now we often like using things like plexiglass or Lexan. I'm just going to replace the sheet of glass and, well, look at that. It doesn't take very long at all for the arc to start moving up through the Lexan. Almost like fast motion compared to how long it took that same distance of damage to occur in our glass sheet. You also might have noticed a bit of smoke and if we look at the plexiglass, well, what you can see is that it doesn't actually have a crack or a split in it. Indeed, what we end up with is a charred path on either side. So what we saw was current actually flowing on the top surface of the charred lexan from one side to the other. Now, you might be wondering, why do we use nice smooth wires for Jacob's ladders? And I thought I'd try something that wasn't that smooth, namely some blades from, well, what I would have called a Swedish saw and seems to be more commonly called a bow saw these days. And, well, look at that. The arc does not move upwards very much. You can see it's sort of struggling to get up there, but the bottom line is the sharp spikes on the saw are really confining the arc pretty much to one or two locations. And that's because the electric fields are concentrated on those points way more so than on the larger diameter of the wire. So it's easier for the arc to get started and it's also requiring a much larger jump to get to the next point on the saw and that pretty much results that the arc stays in one place. Now, if we use my DSLR camera and we set it up to take 60 frames a second or more accurately 59.54 and we set the length of each image to be one thousandth of a second, what we can end up doing is seeing the different form the arc takes at different points in the AC cycle. Right now it's almost a bright glowing white and at other points it's much more of a narrow thin purple. And what it is, is the narrow thin purple is generally where the arc was just starting or possibly ending. And there really isn't much energy in the air yet. As the arc really gets going and the air heats up, you start getting light being generated by the air and the molecules in the air essentially becoming white hot. And you get emissions that are much more like you would see in an old-style incandescent lamp. 
So what happens if we were to put a piece of glass between our two saw blades? Well, that's the real reason I've been playing around with glass and saw blades. And what I'll do is not only put it between the two saw blades, but try and get them as close together as possible. And, well, look at that. We suddenly get a corona discharge. And what the corona discharge is, is essentially where the electric field at the points of the saw blade is so strong that it does indeed rip the electrons off the various air molecules when those higher energy electrons fall back into lower energy levels we get the beautiful purple glow. Now when we're doing that we're essentially creating charged molecules and of course they interact with the high voltage and get repelled by it and I can actually feel a wind of ozone coming from that area. So to show you that there is indeed a wind being produced by the corona well, what I did was I took an old vintage Christmas candle and put it near the glass. And when we turn on the corona, you can see the flame on the candle starts moving from the breeze. A rather nice demonstration. Now, besides being a very neat phenomena to do some experiments with, we actually use things like arcs and corona discharges in our everyday lives. A good example is the spark plug in most cars, in most gasoline cars I should say, and well in this case in my riding lawnmower. And as you can see, the spark plug has a little arc in it used to ignite the gasoline in the combustion chamber. We also use sparks in things like stoves or barbecues to ignite the propane or natural gas. Again, something we typically take for granted and don't even think about. We also use sparks to ignite the flame in things like our furnaces and boilers in the winter. Here's the burner from my old boiler. And as you can see, when we turn it on, there is a nice big spark, probably in the 10 kilovolt range, that beautifully ignites the flame. We also commonly use arcs to create light such as in the flashes of many modern cameras or in fluorescent tubes, although they're largely disappearing. And of course, in the lowly neon light that these days we often see in the switches of our power bars to indicate the power is turned on. And finally, arc welding is used to join many things out of metal. So there you go, quite a few practical applications of arcs and electrical discharges and these are all good examples why we really do need to understand these things to make many of our modern technologies work. Well that brings this video to an end. I hope you enjoyed it. Happy Halloween and see you next time.